Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be taking a look at two Emma Rosen books as part of Tarden Dane's Indie Read Along. So first up we have Lily the Limpet Gets Lost by Emma Rosen and Eugenia Blackery. And this is like a, a children's book. It also has a good moral because while it does talk about, you know, limpets and how they work and the sea and that kind of thing, it also encourages kids to put anything back that they find, you know. Even like shells can be used as homes for crabs. Uh, and also Emma signed it, which is very good of her. Uh, she sent me both of these. We did a book exchange, so I sent her two of my books and she sent me two of hers. I'm just going to read a couple of pages out. It's all written in poetry. The pool emptied a little when water left with the tide, but Lily never worried about getting too dry. She would cling to the rock as tight as could be, so from her shell no water could leak. She had lived on that stone almost since she was born, and just where she rested a circle was worn. Her shell fitted perfectly onto her spot, and so she never lost so much as a drop. Granny and Billy sat down by the sea. Billy peered into the bucket, squealing with glee. We found so much, Granny, as we followed the tide. The crab shell and rock, I love the seaside. Now Billy said, Gran, I'm glad you had fun, but there's one thing to do before we are done. Everything here must go back in the sea. That's, what, that's where they're safe and where they should be. Billy was careful when he put the things back. Gran helped him figure out just where they'd sat. The shell in some seaweed, the crab under a ledge, and the stone in a deep pool just near the edge. The splash of the stone made Lily's heart race. She turned and her stone was back in its place. Lily climbed on and with relief closed her eyes, while stuck to her rock she awaited the tide. So yeah, I don't want to read all of this because obviously I want to give you a reason to actually pick it up and get it. I mean, I'm obviously not the target audience, but I do really like that message. I think that's a really healthy message for it to have. It's well written, the illustrations are super cute as you can see, so I gave it a 4 out of 5. We're going to hand over to Future Me now, who has read Milk. Okay, Dane from the future here, and I have Milk by Emma Rosen, book number two that I'm going to be reviewing in this video. This is a story of breastfeeding in a society that's forgotten how. I'm going to read the blurb. Emma Rosen assumed that breastfeeding would be easy. After all, it is the natural way for humans to feed our offspring, and women have been doing it for millennia. Motherhood turned Emma's world upside down. Despite meticulous preparations and the best of intentions, breastfeeding was one of the greatest challenges she had to face. With conflicting advice and mounting pressure to stop from family, friends and healthcare professionals, would Emma be able to overcome the many obstacles and breastfeed her baby as she so desperately wanted? In this memoir, Emma tells her story, interwoven with everything she's learned about why, in our society, breastfeeding is far from easy. Milk is both emotional and heartwarming in the way that only a mother's story can be. It is a must-have book for all breastfeeding mothers and those supporting them. So, I kind of put this off for a little bit just because, well, obviously I'm a male, so in any case, I don't need to breastfeed. But I, I also don't particularly ever plan on having kids, so it doesn't necessarily seem like something that might come up in my life. But, um, I mean, I've read a few of Emma's other bits and I've, um, you know, I really like her videos, so I was determined to check this one out. And once I started reading it, I was kind of hooked, so... What's really interesting about this is this kind of structure that it's partly scientific research and, you know, some really great sourcing in here, like results of surveys, uh, quotes from like experts and all of that stuff. And then it kind of intermingles that with Emma's own story. And actually, I'm going to go through now and uh, check out some of these tabs and you'll start to see what I mean. So, for example, I thought this was really interesting because I have quite an interest in the ancient Egyptians. So, um... Wet nursing is an age-long tradition that spans cultures, with King Tutankhamun having built an amazing tomb for his wet nurse, Maya. Examples are documented in ancient Rome and in the Bible. When a wet nurse was sought by the Pharaoh's daughter for the baby Moses, his biological mother was secured for the task. In ancient Rome, unwanted, discarded female babies would be bought to be slaves and nursed by slave wet nurses. There was little alternative until formula came about. Women nursed each other's babies as a favour or as paid work. Uh, Emma also says it's one of, uh, wet nursing is one of the uh, oldest pro professions having its roots around 2000 BC. And she says uh, wet nursing was so common by the 17th and 18th centuries in Western Europe that only the very poorest women fed their own babies. It was so prevalent that even wet nurses hired cheaper wet nurses to feed their babies while they worked for richer employers. Which is crazy. I like this little bit here as well. She says, uh, historically, most people wouldn't have used animal milk at all until it was introduced by Europeans, let alone give it to babies. In fact, most human adults lack the enzyme to digest cow's milk. We're only meant to drink milk from our own species. Amen. And I thought it was interesting because that's, you know, one of the arguments that I hear for veganism. 
And it's interesting that the same holds true for feeding a child, you know. But then it makes you think, like, if if you wouldn't feed your child milk, why would you drink it yourself, you know? This bit's really messed up as well. So basically, Emma's pretty damning about uh, the use of formula. And I'm just going to read this, this couple of uh, pa paragraphs here. Formula-fed babies seem like the norm, and so our biological method of feeding becomes fraught. When you're tired and unsure of yourself, it's easy to be swayed. This is made worse by advertising from companies making the formula milk. In the past, and still in some countries, hospitals gave away free formula samples. Formula company employees gave gifts to nurses and doctors to encourage them to endorse their products. Nestle even notoriously dressed up its saleswomen as nurses in Africa to get poor women to use their products, thinking they were recommended by health professionals. Even now, formula companies spend something like 10-15% to 15 of their profits on advertising, and many unethical practices continue. As a result, breastfeeding rates have plummeted. In the 1970s, reports appeared that babies were dying in the developing world due to the use of formula. If you don't have access to boiling water, then you cannot sterilise a bottle or ensure bacteria present in the powder are killed. Poor women would even often dilute formula to make it last longer, meaning its nutritional content was lowered. If you also consider that some women may have been illiterate and so unable to read the instructions, or even that they may not have been present in her native language, you can see just how hard it would have been to make formula safely for all babies. Okay, I finished it. So I've just got three more tabs. So I thought this was interesting uh, on the subject of weaning. Uh, Emma says, When you wean somebody off something, you reduce their reliance on it. The word comes from the Anglo-Saxon weanian, which means to become accustomed to something else. Weaning from breast milk starts when solids are introduced, when a baby starts to get nutrients from other sources in addition to breast milk. Over time, the baby shifts their needs more onto solid food until, eventually, they stop breastfeeding altogether. Just that's cool, the kind of etymology there. I thought this was interesting here it's, as well. It, uh, it goes to show that a similar thing happens uh, in the dairy industry. So dairy manufacturers like pay to develop these studies that say cheese is good for you and it's like mate cheese isn't good for you the nutritional claims and labeling of baby food started to come under fire and together with research conducted in the meantime led to the recommendation in 2001 that solids should not be introduced until six months although this is a highly controversial area of science with many papers being financed with many papers being financially backed by baby food manufacturers the upshot is that there is no harm in waiting to wean and it does appear to reduce the risk of gastrointestinal infections in the meantime, breast milk or formula milk provide a balance of nutrients and plenty of calories. And just one last thing I wanted to say here, which I thought was very cute. She talks about Finn and she calls him uh, my little limpet, which obviously we now have Lily the Limpet, the book. So that was quite cool. So yeah, all in all, I thought this was a really well written memoir, like uh, for a self-published or an indie book, I should say. Uh, it was really well, you know, edited, formatted, didn't spot any errors or anything like that. My only real criticism would maybe be that basically it focuses so heavily on the first baby so like the first half is the first baby then the second third is the second baby and then like the last one sixth is the third baby but i suppose that's just like kind of the nature of it and also the fact that like uh you know obviously she's had more time with the other two babies more time to think back over it but also that as you become a parent for a third time i guess you kind of you know you're you know a lot of the stuff. You don't know all of it. And actually, I think that was also a very important message to take away from it, that even in her third pregnancy and her third time breastfeeding, she learned a lot of stuff then as well. But um, yeah, all in all, I think it's quite a, quite, you know, hopeful book as well. So yeah, I enjoyed it. I gave it like a 3.75, maybe a 4 out of 5. So we have it. That's what I thought of Milk, a story of breastfeeding in a society that's forgotten how by Emma Rosen. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Go through and uh, check out Emma's channel as well if you haven't already. Uh, subscribe to mine too. I think we did that bit. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.